Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of The Strangers Podcast. My name is Bilal. And my name is Kifah. And today we have an amazing guest speaker, Jake Matthews. We spoke about a lot of amazing things. Uh, obviously, his reversion to Islam. And we also spoke about what it takes to get to the top level in mixed martial arts. Enjoy. Stay tuned. We have with us Jake Matthews. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, everyone knows Jake as an amazing UFC fighter. Um, you've just had a recent win. Congratulations on that. Thank you. That was a beautiful fight. I did watch that. Um, tell us a bit about your life, Jake. Yeah, thanks for having me on, first of all. Really appreciate Hi, it. It's awesome to be here. Um, yeah, pretty pretty standard Aussie kid growing up. Uh, very active in sport. You know, very strong sort of family life growing up. And yeah, I mean, obviously being active in sport led me into getting into martial arts. My my dad was he's been into martial arts his whole life. So it sort of stemmed from him. He actually, he's actually doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu before the UFC wow. ever did their first show. So early nineties, yeah. So he was before, he was before it's popular. School. Yeah, yeah. So he used to show us little things, and the first time I really got into any sort of combat sport was boxing. That was more for football. So I played high level football, um, did some boxing in the off season for fitness, and then that pretty much. So I played high level footy, but. They want tall kids, and I was a late bloomer. So it got to a point where I had, it was really hard for me to get selected. Yeah, and just left a bit of a bit of taste in my mouth. And I started training at the time. It's about two months after I started training. The coach asked me if I wanted to have a a um an amateur fight. An amateur. How old fight. were you at this point? I was I was about fifteen or sixteen. Yeah, and the yeah. opponent was twenty four. Wow. And yeah, I, I still I still wanted to pursue a football career. Yeah, I still wanted to play yeah. Haw Hawthorne. Don't hold it against me, but um, yeah, and um, I was just a just a kid who wanted to play footy. Thought I'd go have a fight. No expectations, no pressure, no nerves. Yeah. Uh, I was expecting to get to get beaten up, to be honest. And I remember on the night we were, we were warming up, and then we hear this massive, this like bang, bang, and we're like, "What's that?" So, you know, we look at the hallway. It's my opponent kicking the pads, and my old man's like, "Nah," he's like, "Let's like maybe we shouldn't do it." <laughs> I said, "I'm already here. I got to do it." So I uh, so we jumped in. And I just put the I put the video up recently. It looks like it's a two second knockout. That was actually the second. Oh, I, I actually seen that video. Round. I seen that video. That yeah. was the second round. So it was like two seconds. You, you were full wearing the headgear and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. This was this is like well well before any like the octagon was legal in Melbourne. Yeah. So really old old. Even though I'm 29. It, it was like old school days. And yeah, got the got the knockout. And from that point on, I just I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. I said to said to my dad, I want to give up the football and pursue a career. Straight away after the first fight. Yeah, I remember mm. I, was eating, I was eating like a Zinger burger in the car and I was like... <laughs> that was think, amazing. I think, I think I'm like, yeah, I think I want to do this. It's felt good. I felt oh, like I just felt natural, natural at it. And then, and then yeah, here we are now. What about the transition? Um, you know, and studying the, the other martial arts, when did that come into play? So, so I started more so with kickboxing um, and then... Like no gi jiu-jitsu has taken off recently. So shorts and rashi. Yeah. It's taken yeah. off recently with like the rise of Craig Jones and Gordon Ryan. Mm -hmm. But there's probably like three people in an OE class. It was very, very unpopular. Everyone wanted to do gi. Uh, maybe maybe because you get graded, you get the belts. It's a bit more rewarding. Yes. Yeah. Potentially. But it was, yeah, like no gi was all, like non-existent. So, I, and I, I had that mindset. I just wanted to train in the gi. So I didn't really do any no gi until a few fights in. And I obviously realized I needed it. And, um... And then I progressed into, you know, meeting, meeting uh, the Abdo brothers, which are Bilal and Ali Abdo, which are um, Commonwealth and Olympic wrestlers. Yeah. Started training with them a lot, wrestling. Uh, you know, I've always kept my boxing because that's my forte in the striking. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, they just, you just progress. You sort of jump from here to there. You go through phases. I've done some Kyokushin karate, kickboxing, Dutch style kickboxing. Um, but my, my two main strengths, main loves are, are jiu-jitsu and boxing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You're a big fan of wrestling. I am. I, I'm a fan of wrestling because it's it's the hardest sport in the world. It is. It's, it's the crazy. hardest sport in the world, and it's. I like that. The you you won't see. I don't think you'll ever see wrestling grow in Australia to what it is around the world because you have to grow up a certain way. It's to, so underrated here. Yeah. Mm. You you're getting thrown. Even if you take someone down, like you're getting you're hitting the ground, and you have to stand back up, and you get yeah. taken down. You stand back up, and it's just it's just uh it's such a brutal sport. And I've been to, I wrestled in Chicago. I was, I was in Chicago for, between Chicago and Albuquerque for probably nine months. No. I'm training with John Jones and- um, How, how was that? How was that feeling training with John Jones? 
it was good. I felt it was something I needed to do just yeah. to get, just to get my 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 name out there. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was in the Ultimate Fighter. I was unsuccessful with that, and I, I got home from the Ultimate Fighter. Two weeks later, I flew to Chicago. Yeah, we're there with John Jones. Um, yeah, it was just what an experience. Eighteen year old John Jones, Cowboy Cerrone, um, Arthur Jones, Chandler Jones. You know, they got really cold in Chicago, so we went to Jamaica. That's a that story from another, do another podcast for that one, but that's a podcast um, on its own. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Um, oh, I've got some stories from after I retire. I'm yeah. gonna come up with like a tell all, yeah, and it'll, be a, it'll be a New York Times bestseller, but um, yeah, just being 18, being a, just you know, no other commitments, just training, yeah, being in yeah. that environment with those guys, it was good. But I, I realized something in those big gyms, you're just a number, you're just a number, you have to be something special to get the attention of the coaches. Mm. Um, there were certain fighters that were high level and they'd have three coaches watching them shadow box. Wow. And then the other fighters are running their own class. So so in Australia, it's, you know, the attention was on me, like all the attention from my coaches. You know, you do have to travel and seek out the best training. So there's a lot there's a lot of traveling and still till today, there's not one gym in Australia where it has everything. That's right. Mm, that's right. Of. So that was, that's the only challenge in Australia, but it's getting, we're getting there. Yeah. And I feel the more our fighters take off overseas and train elsewhere then it's going to limit the progress of the sport here so mm, i wanted to stay here yeah. be australian born and bred fighter and um and i believe i've done that i'm one of the you know be- between me and alex volkanovsky i think he's he's got a f- one more win than me but i was for a long time i was the most winningest australian born ufc fighter in history amazing wow. man so, amazing. And hopefully i can you know we'll, we'll keep battling for that title but yeah. um, i'll try and get it back but yeah, I've, I've, I think I've done well considering. Speaking, I've trained, yeah, yeah, speaking about that that Volkanovski, how, how did you how did you find that fight? You as a UFC fighter, when you watch fights like uh, Islam and and Volkanovski, you know, us as as people that don't fight, we're obviously you know like, why do you do this? Why don't you do that? You know, punch here, throw there, get out of that. You as a UFC fighter, when you're watching a fight, what are you saying? What are you thinking in your in your mind? I understand that. There's so many different points of view. Um, you know, the, the, your coaches will be screaming something and they can't necessarily see what's on what's going on over here. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's up to the fighter in there to know what's best. And I mean, I don't think any two, there's no two fighters that are as good and as knowledgeable as Volkanovski and Islam. That's, that was an insane fight. Um, and I'm very, very torn between the two, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. But, who, who do you think won? <laughs> oh, like, I, I, think, I think the judges had it right. I'll live yeah, that, you know yeah. I, mean? I think yeah. the judges had it right. Even Alex himself said it. It, it was, it was very close, too close to argue if it went yeah. either way. To be honest, if yeah. it went either way, you, you know, you leave it in the hands of the judges, and you let the fight be that close. You can't really. Complain. Lots of respect had, to both fighters. I've yeah. been on good sides of split decisions. I've been on bad sides of split decisions. So, yeah. and, and you know, the the every, it seems that the fans get more upset than the fighter because the fighter understands. Yeah. Maybe I should have pushed a little bit harder. I could have mm-hmm. done more, but um, but yeah, it's it's at the end of the day, that's why we have to train so hard, and we have to be. You can't rely on the coaches in the corner. You know? They're there to give their two cents, but you're the one who's in there, and you have to make sure. You know you don't you don't pay your coaches off. You obviously listen to what they're saying, but there's some there's some things where you have to take the reins and make the decision. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a kind of a it's really easy to be you know, an armchair critic. Um, and I remember I used to when I used to watch the UFC, and because it was like it's not like in football which is my main sport where you watch all levels of the sport you kind of just see the UFC and and you don't, and you don't see you know what it takes to get to that level it wasn't until a friend of mine is uh, you know started actually doing MMA and is and he's still an amateur and I see him as like a freak now <laughs> and then I and now I have such a newfound respect for people you know who are in the UFC so I want to ask you what does it take for you to actually push yourself to that limit because it's so easy to be ordinary you know, it's so easy to just, you know, one day wake up and say, you know what, I'll, I can make it comfortably as a semi-professional, you know, fighter and maybe take up, take on a job on the side. How do you take that next level? It's it's a big commitment. I was, I was, I say lucky, but let's not say lucky because I, I worked hard for it, but I'm, I got into this early, which is sort of a, it's sort of kind of like a double-edged sword because I got into it early enough where I didn't have a mortgage, I didn't have kids, I was yeah. living at home. Yeah. I had the ability to just train three times a day, mm. seven days a week, and just focus entirely on traveling for training, training at home and fighting. And, um, you know, again, again, that is, I did sacrifice, I guess, like the, the fun era of my youth, but my my mindset was, 
I sacrifice, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, maybe like four years yeah. of fun, mm. work hard, and then I can enjoy the rest of my life. Whereas vice versa, people go have fun for those four years, three, four years, mm. and then they're working hard for the rest of their life. Yeah. So that's that was the mindset I had. I had a goal. I knew what I needed to do to get there. Um, deferred from uni for six months, mm. 10 years ago. So, um, and I never, never went yeah, back. It was, <laughs> I always had the intention of never going back, but I, I just uh, I said to my parents, I'll defer and then I'll go back, but I never had the intention of doing it because yeah. I had I had so much belief in myself that I'd I'd make it, and um, yeah, I think it's just it's just being willing to to put it all on the line and sacrifice whatever you have to to get there, and that's what I did. And again, I was I was fortunate that I got into it so young, um, but then I also had to learn on the job. That's why people go, oh, you know, you had so many fights in the UFC, almost a decade, and you haven't. You know, you're not a champion yet. It's I had to learn on the job while fighting like the best trained killers in the world yeah. for the last ten years. And I'm yeah. you know, and considering the average oh, Michael Bisming told me the average fight career in the UFC is like three or four fights in about two years. Wow. And I've had like eighteen 19, 18 fights and almost wow. 10 years. That's what I mean, just about armchair critics, like, you know, yeah, saying something yeah. like, how are you not a champion yeah. yet? Yeah. But you just don't see what it takes to even get there, yeah. to get it's, in the octagon. It's, it's, it's um, you, you got to commit to it and it's got to be the only thing that you're, you're solely focused on. You can't be, you know, like people with business, they, they try and put their hands in all these different pies and, you know, none of it works out. Mm. Whereas with MMA, you need to just commit to it. And that's that's my sole focus. It's the only thing. Every morning I woke up, even even still now, I've got kids and stuff. But when it's time to train, it's um. What do I say to people? I say there's a certain certain criteria, a certain workload that must be fulfilled to do what we do. And regardless of how you feel, it needs to be done to an extent. Obviously, you've got bad injuries, you can mm-hmm. obviously take time off. But I've had I've had mornings where you know the missus has to literally sit me up in bed because I can't sit up. Wow. wow. I still got to go train two three times a day. You know, look, looking after the kids, I've I've had times where got my you know five, four or five month old daughter, um, not making as much money back then, so so my partner was working, so I'm taking this baby. I remember I was driving from oh, an hour and forty five minutes, sometimes two hours fifteen minutes to Berwick, wow. so the other side of the city to go hit pads. I remember changing changing nappies on the yeah. side of the Monash freeway, wow, and training and you know sparring. You know, switch off to dad mode, change a nappy, or give a quick bottle back to sparring again. That was that was my life for that's know, incredible for a while. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's um you just got to be ready just to just to commit one hundred percent. Like I still till today take the kids with me to the gym, you know, playing both roles. But uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And if we go back, I'd do everything the exact same because, like I said, I've had a long, a long, long career, so I've obviously done something right. Yeah, amazing, amazing. You were saying you were saying you know for the. For the four years of your life, you know, between 18 and 22, um, that you did, you committed a lot of your time and you stayed away from a lot of, you know, things. You know, I, I think, I think, you know, maybe this point could be good to not, not just Muslims, but even non-Muslims, mm-hmm. you know. Um, do you think if you did sort of pay attention or, or go towards, you know, partying, drinking, alcohol, you know, drugs, do you think it would have destroyed the future you could have had right now? Like that destroyed where you would have been right now? Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I've... I've I've seen it. I, I I still coach. I still coach um, out of love, not for money. There's no there's no money in coaching, but just for, for the love of it, I I coach a lot of guys that fight, and I've seen it. You know, I've seen the guys I've trained with, guys that I coach. They they just want to go have fun. They want to go to overseas on holidays for however long. I say that's why I go do it, but don't expect to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they, they don't necessarily understand it. And I try to explain. I said. You, know, you want to be able to. In, there's a bigger picture than just those four years, um, and you know, I was I was blessed that I was able to to foresee that when I was so young, and I was always very, very um, very calculated in in not only inside the fights but also outside the fights. I could see ahead. I knew what I needed to do, how to do it, what to avoid. But yeah, I was lucky that I just never never had the kind of personality where I, I didn't like partying, I didn't like drinking, mm. never done a drug in my life. Um, well, I've never done a drug in my life. Um, <laughs> and you don't just say that now because no, you're Muslim. No, 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 I've never, never done a drug in my life. You know, we'll, you know, we'll celebrate with a cigar after a fight, maybe, uh, and that's about it. You know, I've probably, probably been drunk twice in my life. Um, just never, never gravitated towards it. Yeah. Never liked it. Never enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and yeah, I can absolutely attribute that. It's not like I didn't have fun in my life. I've had, I've had more fun than most people. I've been 
like almost every continent on earth. Like I said, I've, I've trained with John Jones, trained with the, the best guys, I've yeah. fought around the world. Um, stories still from Jamaica. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of stories to tell. So, yeah. and that's all without doing any any sort of degenerate, um, having any sort of degenerate fun, I guess. Yeah, that's powerful. So what message would you have to a, a 15 year old now, um, you know, coming into MMA, um, looking to take it seriously, but they're a bit on the fence, you know, because like you said, you came into it early, but now everyone mm-hmm. wants to get into the UFC. Yes. You know, every, every fighter wants to get into the UFC. What message would you have to a 15-year-old coming into it now, or even say a 21-year-old, you know, because some people mm-hmm. come into it late. What message would you have for them to actually differentiate themselves from the rest? Yeah, so for that for that, that demographic, because it is that is the next evolution of the sport is, I was one of the first like, kids to get into MMA. Myself and Sage North get very well-rounded. So um, that's that's you see that a lot now. Everyone's good everywhere. And what I'd say to, to kids that are that age, I'm not I'm not going to tell them to defer from uni or drop out because their <laughs> parents will be sending me a message. But <laughs> if you, if you want to do it, you need to understand what it takes in the workload, and you need to be the dedication. To it. Yeah, if if you're gonna if you're gonna commit to it and do it, like, like I said, I, I was willing to do whatever it took. I didn't work. I had no money. Uh, I was catching the train to my sessions as a UFC fighter. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, P- people people have that image like you're a UFC fighter, you're ro- mm-hmm. rolling around in a Lambo. You're... P- people think that. Not even UFC. I, I, I did the Ultimate Fighter and I, I didn't win the Ultimate Fighter. I just came back from the Ultimate Fighter yeah. and someone goes to me, they're like, what? like, I was at Epping Plaza and they're like, why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing? They're like, like, you should be in a Ferrari. And like, so I'm like... Yeah. Like you, said, like, you should be walking around chats. Yeah, I said it cost me money. It, I lost money going to the fight. I didn't make any money. Um, so uh, people obviously know about like the pay and, and things now. And um, I go, going to the to the couch critics just quickly. Hmm. Like I was, I got attacked for saying that I'm happy with what I get paid because I think for what I do, being able to train, do something I love every day, travel the world and fight, hmm. see the world. I think I, it's it's ridiculous what we get paid. What well, I get paid, I won't talk for everyone, but what I get paid. And yeah, I got attacked for that. Mm. No, you don't get paid enough. It's like okay, like I'm, I'm just giving my opinion yeah. on it. But yeah, yeah. so yeah, so I got I got attacked by couch critics there. But mm. um, yeah, for the kids, just that's it. Because everyone's situation is different. Whatever sacrifice has to be, but you, you got to be a hundred, not a hundred percent, hundred twenty percent into it. Yeah, I mean, I sacri- I didn't have like any long term relationships at that age. I didn't didn't party. All my travel was for training. Yeah. Um, just day in, day out training. That was it. Yeah. You know, I, I there was friends that I didn't see, like, you know, luckily still I'm still friends with them today and we, we, we connect a lot now. But during that time, I was almost like a recluse. Like it was just myself and training and that was it. That's and that's what it has to be, especially in the early in the initial days. Yeah. Um yeah. to try and get you know, just try and get to the UFC and then once you're there, it doesn't get any easier. It's that's that's the easy part, believe mm. it or not. Um, then it, then the hard work starts in the UFC because there's nowhere to hide. There's yeah. nowhere to hide. They're all, they're all killers. Every fight's a hard fight. You know, there's levels in the UFC, but on on any given day, a lower-ranked guy can beat a higher-ranked guy. So you yeah. can never, never yeah. like relax or take your focus off. I've done that before and I've lost to guys that I shouldn't have lost to and I've beaten guys that are, on paper I shouldn't have been. Mm. Um, so yeah, just they just be, be willing to put it all on the line and be... So that, well, that doesn't mean like... I don't. I don't mean be ready to work hard. Mm. I mean be ready to, to work hard, but also fail and then finish with nothing. Yeah. yeah. That's that's what the that's what what I say when you need to commit one hundred percent. You need to be ready for that because I was ready. I was ready to hold pads the rest of my life in a gym, fifty bucks an hour. Yeah. Okay. I was ready for that. You, you so, accepted it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I've seen it. That's... I was in, I was in Albuquerque, at Greg Jackson's gym, and it was a good eye opener because what you think. The UFC fight, like you said, rolling around Lambos. It's mm-hmm. not. It's not the case yeah. at all. Like Cowboy Cerrone and John Jones were the ones who were who were cashed up. Uh, everyone else, they're living two, three, four, five up in a house. Wow. Um, because they can't afford rent, so they're all chipping in rent together, holding pads. And these are guys, you know, in the 30, 30s. No education, no qualifications, no kids, no relationship, and now they're going to be doing PTs for the rest of their life. So that's what I mean when you need to be ready to risk wow. it all. That's what you could end up with. But for me, it was it was worth it. But I had enough belief that I, it wouldn't happen. But I was ready if that was the case. Wow. I mean, 
that's that's powerful. I, want, I just want to touch on one thing you said about being ready to be knocked down and get back up, because that's actually something I wanted to ask you. I mean, in life, we all get you know figurative knockdowns, mm. but when you're physically laying physically. there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with millions of people watching and you're looking up at the ceiling, your head on the floor, what's going on in your mind and what kind of mentality does it take to actually lift yourself up both figur figuratively and physically and go again, you know, go and train the next day or the next week or the next month? Yeah, so again, I can't speak for other fighters, but for me, it's so not the last fight, the fight before that, I actually got knocked down every round, like cold, like I was like, Everyone thought the fight was done every time. And it wasn't It wasn't a conscious effort to get up and go. It was autopilot. Wow, just naturally. Because I've, I've trained, I train two, three times a day. My body knows how to react, knows what to do. And this this is this is everything from, this translates to everything from, from being a professional athlete to in to, to even like business, whatever it is. Mm. You need to be so honed in and do so many repetitions and be so knowledgeable that if something does go bad, like in business, your business fails, the next day, you're back at it. You're building a new business. You start yeah. trying again, using what you know. In the fight, my body just went to autopilot and I, I just started fighting. Wow. It's almost almost prefer it because mm. like, I had a fight where I don't remember the fight. This was when Ronda Rousey fought in Melbourne. It was first round. I got kicked in the head. When I say out cold, I mean stiff arms, hit the floor. When he oh, punched me, wow. then I sort of like came to. Um, all I remember was walking out and I remember waking up in an ambulance. So when I woke up in the ambulance, I was like, I got to my coach, I'm like, oh, what happened? I lost. Yeah. He's like, he's like, you won. Like, we'll ju we'll <laughs> no just talk about the fight. And then I, I, he goes, we're no talking way. about the fight. And then I shook my head and I was like, it was the weirdest thing. That's wow. insane. But I don't remember, I don't remember being tired. I don't remember being in, uh, having any like adversity, being in bad positions, fighting out of it, nothing. So you don't, Rogan, you don't even Rogan remember. Me, I don't remember that. You don't even remember the fight happening. No. Wow. That's what I'm saying. The autopilot. Yeah. I've done it so many times and, and done so many repetitions that my body just knows what to do. And that that's the level you need to get to. And I think a lot of fighters is you'll find it's I mean when you get when you get rocked that bad, you can't see, you can't see anything. You're going off feel, you're going off That's your, crazy your training. Yeah. Crazy. That's so, insane. So yeah, so what I'm trying to get at is you need to train so hard um that your body just reacts naturally. It's a it's a it's a subconscious response. Jake I think I think everyone wants to know. Have you accepted Islam? Absolutely. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I think, uh, well, welcome, man. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was. I felt like how do I explain? I, Muslims will understand, but I felt like when I look back, I felt like I was always a Muslim, and I had oh, to just finally Allah. accept it, even though I didn't know. Allah. And I've had I had people. I had a student, an old student, when I had my gym. He's come back to train with me now, and he goes. This is the first time I've seen him since since I uh, took my shahada, and he goes, "My mum always said, he goes, Jake, she goes, Jake's like a like a Muslim. <laughs> he, just has, he just has some tattoos, but he's just like, <laughs> just like he behaves like a Muslim, like the way he behaves." And then I have another friend, like years ago, years ago, I left his house, and he said, "My mum said to me one day that boy will be a Muslim." So wow. it would just, I don't know, just my my character, and and I've always ninety five percent of my friends have always been Muslim. I've just gravitated towards the character. Um, if, if you don't mind me asking, yes. do you feel like, and I think this will be very beneficial for our viewers, do you feel like having Muslim friends made an impact? Only in the sense, I don't want to take it the wrong way, only yeah. in the sense that I saw their character and mm. that's how I wanted to, to be. It's not they, like... They, they uh, didn't say anything. They never yeah. mentioned one yeah. word to me. Yeah. Um, you know, my close friend, friend Akib and Mutman, I'd always ask questions. Because I, I started doing like my research a long, long time ago. Um, I, I was mowing, I have some acreage. I was, I was mowing my grass. It's like six hours of mowing. So I go, I've got to put a podcast on. Yeah. And then, um, so the first podcast I listened to was a history of, of Christianity. And I was never, I was never baptized, never Christian. It was just a, I, like, I love history. I love history. Yeah. So I was listening to it. And then the next time I cut the grass, I was like, I listened to different religion. Because I thought it was completely separate, didn't realize and I started listening to it, and I just it just blew my mind. Um, things going through my head, like all the the conflicts and, and the battles throughout history, for something to me from the outside, it seemed like it's all one Abrahamic religion. It, it was clear. Yeah. And um, so then that 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 kick started the the study and and learning about Islam. Um, 
and I'd always ask my friends questions and I could see they're sort of like, man, this guy knows a lot. What's he, yeah. what's he up to? Yeah. What's he doing? <laughs> and um, and it was, it was only about two weeks before I, I took my shahada that I said to him, I want, I want you to take me to the masjid. I want to talk to the sheikh and, and, and do it because I'm ready. Um, so I, so I actually changed, like changed my lifestyle. It didn't change too much. Cause like I said, I was always, I never ate pork, go figure. Um, never but, like didn't like haven't drank for many, 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 many years. So it was just like, I just had to accept that I was, I was Muslim and, yeah, um, like by no means I'm in my scholar. Uh, I do know a lot about the history of the, the prophets and, and, and the whole storyline. Um, and then the next thing was to learn about the worship and the prayers, which, which I've, I've got, you know, got great friends to help me out with that. And um, just been a good journey. I've just never been happier. Amazing. Never been happier. So and there's, there's things like like life's changed for the better. And obviously, we'll, we'll talk about that and get into that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it's hard to explain, but it's complete. Everything makes sense. Hmm. When when you find your faith and you completely submit to the fact that like God is the best of planners, um, it all makes sense. And, and you know, anxiety's gone you know any so thoughts of feeling depressed or yeah. any depression is, is out the window because yeah you, you know, all, I, I had to explain it there's no stress whatever happens i can always find the silver lining i can always piece things together yeah. and wow. whether it's sooner or later it'll be revealed why things happen and i just sit back now and, and enjoy the ride and and wait for for the benefits to you've got full trust in allah now absolutely absolutely subhanallah i love i love what you said about it wasn't even just the them preaching to you. It was their character. Yeah. Like I've, I'm sure you know the they prophet. Never preached, yeah. Never exactly. Said exactly yeah. right. The prophet Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "I came so, so. only to perfect your character." You know. Mm. Of course, you know we know that he came to do more than that. But the fact that that sentence, you know, outlines just how important a character is, a person's character mm. is. Like Subhanallah, I have I have friends who, you know. You know, for example, you know, I might, you know, hang out with them once or twice a month, you know, and they're, they're not the best, you know, like they're Muslims, but they're not, you know, practicing. And sometimes I, I tell my, I, I ask myself, like, am I actually doing enough to, you know, because I, I might be asked about them, you know, on the day of yeah. Dhamma, why haven't you done more to, you know, to help them, to guide them? But then I think if I'm actually engaging with them, you know, without engaging in the wrong that they do and acting in a way that, you know, they may see as admirable, you know, who knows? That may actually be the you know the catalyst to them like turning back. That they yeah, need. exactly yeah, right, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And I have had people even come to me and say, you know what? Thank you for sharing that post. You know, on your Instagram story about mm -hmm. turning back to Allah and and not leaving your prayers, mm -hmm. even if you're doing you know X, Y, and Z. And Subhanallah, when someone says something like that, it makes you think, wow, like you, it didn't even you, it didn't come across your mind to preach to this person. Yes. Yeah, you know, but somehow the message has been received, and that's what's happened with you, Subhanallah. Absolutely, it's, I think it's the best way. Is just, just, sh just showing your character. Um, and for me, you know, I just want to show the people close to me that I'm, I'm better for it. Mm. And that's, and that's, that's the way you, you preach. It's a, it's indirectly sort of a way to preach, I guess. I have, I have a very interesting. Um, I just remembered a story from Khalid Yassin, is a sheikh, and he says, um, his mum did not accept Islam for so many years after he not only accepted Islam but became a scholar. And then one day he came home and his wife was with his mom. His Somali wife was with his mom. And he said, uh, my mom just told me I just took my shahada. And he said, Allah. what? I've been trying to <laughs> preach to you for 40 years, you know? What's happened? He said, you, he, she told him, you know your wife? You know, she braided my hair. You know, she bathed me. You know, she, mm. she itched my back. <laughs> and I just saw her character and I yes. said, there's no way this so woman is following Allah. something that's not Absolutely. Islam. And I found that remarkable. Subhanallah. Absolutely. And was, uh, your your family now must see, you know, that character in you. And that could be, you know, your way of, you know, pre <laughs> preaching to them, inshallah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I have, I have very young kids, but I know that spending time with, with kids, like with your family, is, is a form of worship as well in Islam. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. that, that um, things like that have increased. It sounds silly, but little things like, you know, like you, like the dogs might need food in the morning and you're running late for a training or work. It's like, I'll feed them after. Now it's like, mm. no, nah, it's like, you got to do it. Like, it's things you have to do. You just feel obliged. Like, you, you hold accountable. You hold accountable. Yeah. Mm. Little things yeah. like, you won't see me tear the smallest bit of a cat wrapper and put it on the ground. Um, you just, 
yeah, you have that accountability that you just can't do anything wrong. You've, and, you've like, cleaned your soul in a way, yeah? Like, you've just... Uh, yeah, absolutely, you know? Yeah. And, and all I can... All, all I try and do is... Is... Be better than yesterday. Yeah. That's what, that's what I try and do. Every day, I just... You know, when, when I'm finishing... You know, my, my Isha prayer and... Finish up for the day, I'll just say, you know, tomorrow i will to try and do more. You know, maybe today I read, I read Quran for half an hour, tomorrow we'll do an hour. Mm. I mean, um, five prayers today, right? So tomorrow five prayers and there's some thicker as well. And just trying to add to it. And some days you, you fall behind, but yeah, I just try and keep reminding myself to be better every day. Yeah. And go, going back to uh, putting putting out you know, trust in Allah, you know what I mean? It's We landed in Utah from the last fight. Mm. We got in the, the, me and Mutman got in the car. We left the airport and he throws his phone in the car. And he lost it. I said, what? And he goes, your opponent pulled out. He's injured. Oh, and, you- and he's he's losing it, and I'm sitting in the car like this. He's like, "What are you smiling about?" But there's a plan. Wow. But there's a plan, and he's like, "All right, all right." And then, um, I mean, you could say in a way like I got a I got a a better opponent for me. I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't say an easier opponent, but a better opponent stylistically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't have beaten the last guy, but this whatever happened, it led to a win. You know, a good win, good exposure. The fans loved it. It, it all worked out, you know what I mean? We went from not having an opponent at all, yeah, going to fight week, to getting an opponent and, and winning the fight. Being in a better position. Being in a better position, yeah. yeah. Now, sometimes I take it, I probably take it too far. Like, you know, my partner would be like, oh, you didn't take the bins out and the trucks missed it. I said, oh, obviously, I wasn't meant to put them out today. I mean, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, wasn't, it, far, so it wasn't yeah, written yeah, for me, you know? Kid, like, forget, the, <laughs> forget yeah. the kids at school. Oh, it wasn't for yeah. me. <laughs> Just tell that, what can you do, you know? So, I take it too far sometimes, but I honestly, like, every little thing that happens, mm. no matter how minuscule it is, I try to find the silver lining and, and piece together why. Mm. And that helps so much. You know, I could be running, I could hit traffic and running late for a session. I could miss a session. Like I mentioned, I take the kids to a training session. Mm. You know, them being naughty and yelling and limiting my training used to stress me out beyond, beyond, beyond explanation. I just used to stress out. Oh, I missed one session. Now I'm gonna lose my fight because yeah. of it. And now, now it's not. It's a pun. It just all the anxiety, stress goes away. It's it's very hard to explain, but that's the biggest turnaround for me since since reverting. How yeah. how so, how did your how did your family react to you becoming Muslim? Did they see it coming? You know, whether it be your your partner or your your mum and dad or, or stuff like that. Did they see it sort of coming? Um, I, my my partner expected it. Expected it to come. Um, my other family members. I was very, very, very covert. Like I said, my, 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 my two best friends who are Muslim as well didn't even know until yeah. I said to them, like, I'm ready. Because uh-huh. my, my thought process was not, um, I didn't want anyone to try and persuade me. Yeah. Like, oh, he's, he, he's teetering. He might become Muslim. Let's try and, I didn't want that at all. I wanted it to be completely my decision, my own journey until I was 100% certain. And it was about a year and a half of, so from the time I, first listened to the podcast, which was the history of Islam by uh, Elias Baghdadi, I think his name was. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was just basic, just simply just the history of, of, of Islam and the prophets. Um, and it was about a year and a half from that point till I decided to take my shahada. So it was, there was no doubt in my mind, you know, I still, after a year and a half, I still feel the same way. It's not a phase or a fad. I'm sure there's people that go through those phases. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to make sure it wasn't one of those. And made the decision. Um, my mum was, I was a bit like, I don't know, I, I, I don't get nervous for fights. I'm a little <laughs> bit nervous to tell my mum. Yeah. But she took it, she was just like, she's like, you're good, she's okay. She's, she's had family members that have, you know, converted to um, like Jehovah's Witness yeah. and other things before. Yeah. So mm-hmm. she, she's used to it. She is very accepting, happy for me. She always asks, you know, she's, she's a, She's Australian. She's Aussie, right? Mm. So she'll come over. She's like, oh, how's all your, your Muslim stuff going? And I said, yeah, no, it's good. She's like, oh, she asked about the prayers and stuff. So it's it's uh, it's a good support. That's amazing. Um, yeah, honestly, that's I, had, amazing. I had no adverse reactions to it. Big big shout out to mum for, for supporting Jake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mom, love you. Um, <laughs> your Muslim even- stuff is, is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Just all of it. How's it? Uh- and then, yeah, when we put the, when I put it out on Instagram, I, I didn't really want to. But the reason then I decided to put it out public was the first few months, I felt a weight on my shoulders like, you know, like, 
it's time to pray. I want to go pray or, and people, oh, you know what yes, I mean? Like, yes, yes. People are going to be like, oh, like what's, what are you doing? Or mm-hmm. with, with fasting, I just wanted people to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they don't have to keep asking yeah. or wonder yeah. why I'm doing this. Yeah. I don't have to keep explaining myself. And once we did it, I, did, I didn't want to you know, be known as what's called like an Instagram Muslim, I guess. Mm. I said, look, I'll put this up and that's probably one of the few things I'll put up yeah. um, in regards to Islam on, on Instagram. But the response was, I think there was over a thousand comments maybe. Amazing. And I, I don't remember seeing a single bad comment. That's amazing. Yeah. And yeah, the people that reached out that wanted to just, you know, not maybe not even for the reason of reverting themselves, but just to learn. Yeah. Um, it was It was amazing. Amazing, yeah. amazing, that's amazing. Um, so has anyone in your family accepted uh, Islam after you? Not yet, not yet. I mean, it's, it's, even myself. I, I like the way you said "not yet." Yeah. <laughs> not yet, yeah, yeah. 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 Inshallah, you know. Inshallah, okay. inshallah, so, inshallah yeah, no. But it's uh, even myself. It was only, it's not even a year yet for myself. Yeah. Officially taking the shahada. Yeah. You know, I I do say like unofficially. I, I feel like I've I've been a Muslim for for years now, mm. but officially it's it was January this year. Mm. So. You know, I think everyone's got their own journey and I think it's, it's such a beautiful way to find your faith is, is on your own. Yeah. Like I wasn't born into it. Yeah. Um, it's something that I like literally fell into. Like I decided like, oh, I'll listen to this podcast. I could have listened to some, Yeah. I could have listened to Joe Rogan podcast like that. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows how the, how it could have played out. But yeah. every decision I've made in my life has led me to this. Inclu- like, even if, like if people ask me about tattoos, you know, they go, oh, mm. You know, you regret tattoos. It's like, look, if I could literally just go to this and wipe them off, I would. But at the same time, every little decision I've made, big decisions, small decisions, it's led me to where I'm today. Yeah. And it led me to yeah. find Islam. So if I could go back, I wouldn't change anything. Mm. In in the fear that I wouldn't end up where uh, I'm today. Yeah, of course. Yeah, 100%. That's, that's, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. Yes, that's what I told people. Um, but yeah, you know, everyone's got their own journey. I have my journey. It's, you know, I'm t- 29, 28 when I, when I reverted. So... Who knows? Who knows what what's in store for my close friends and family? We'll see. Yeah, it's final. For any um, any you know sports figure or, or someone that's you know well known, and they are interested in Islam, you know what 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 would what can you say to pretty much support them and help them, in you know coming closer to Islam, accepting it maybe you know maybe they need that that little bit of you know, and they may also be scared of what it would do to their yeah. to their career. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 I mean, for me, my career it didn't affect it at all. I don't. I think this day and age, I mean, most of the comments are probably a lot non-Muslims, and they mm. like I had people message me that I went to school with, and they're, they're not Muslims, and they congratulated me. Wow. I was talking to a I was talking to a dad at my daughter's kinder today, and he goes, "Oh, do you travel with a lot of Muslim guys?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "I'm actually Muslim myself," and he's like, "Oh, it's so good." And so I think people are very accepting these days. Are amazing. You know, a lot more accepting than in the past. Um, but so I would say, don't be afraid of that at all, because. I was a little bit hesitant and it was complete 180 to what I thought it would be with the support. Um, do, do your research. Don't don't rush it. But what I say to people is like whether you like whether you commit to it or not, like my beliefs my beliefs changed and I had the beliefs of a Muslim. My beliefs are my beliefs. I can't lie to myself. You know, I can on the outside I can I can convert to yeah. something else or I can pretend to be something else, mm. but inside that's that is what I am. So if that's how they feel, you know, do your research, take your time, you know, seek out help. I wouldn't, don't go out too publicly too early, but, you know, seek people that you trust, yeah. ask their advice, people that are knowledgeable, people that are, uh, you know, pretty well scholared in the religion um, and ask everything you need to ask before before you take your shahada. Because you want to make sure when you do it, you know what you're getting into and it's you're not going to, like I said before, it's not a phase or a fad where you're yeah. going to fall out of it eventually. Mm. And that's that's uh, and that's just from my own experience, and that's the way I handle it and did it. And I mean, my faith is just as strong as ever. Every day gets stronger, mm-hmm. and every day I, I'm happy and grateful that I did it. Allahu Akbar. I want to ask you, as Muslims, as people who are born Muslim, one thing that we, I'd say, a lot of us take for granted is our prayer. You know, we we just pray the five times. You know, we don't. Some of us, you know, I'm guilty of this myself. You know, you pray. And then you're on the third rakah and you're like, oh, I'm on the third rakah. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I haven't, yeah. actually, yeah. I haven't actually paid attention to yeah. it. So I want to ask you about your first prayer mm. after you took your shahada. Tell us about that, the first time you put your hand on the ground, that feeling. I'm sure you probably, you know, were unsure of the words and or you've done your research as well. Yeah. But just the feeling of how you felt. 
just because we do we do take it for granted we've always we've yeah. always had it so to actually have that for the first time it was so i did my shahada in at the masjid and uh it was it was around um through of time so we we prayed pretty much straight after and the first thing i thought i'm like what like there's no like they're not talking i've heard seen i've watched prayers and yeah so then my friends explained like you know the the afternoon prayers yeah silent. <laughs> so i was learning there but the first thing i noticed was in sajud i was like i feel like I felt like I was asleep in this position. I just felt so calm and relaxed. It was just like it was, even even like every every time I do it, I just wanna I just wanna stay there a little bit extra. Yeah. Um. That's the first thing that I noticed, and obviously, yeah, I, I did. So I did learn. So I do know like my surahs, and um, I keep learning every day. So, and I I can't remember the last day I haven't prayed five times. Mm-hmm. In all honesty, so I, I really do um, put in the effort to do that, and I go above. I do like dhikr and. You know, try and do. If I'm up at night, I'll do qiyam as well. It's important. Um, so I, I just feel again that obligation. You're making up for lost time. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> and um, and then I, I said to my friends, I said, I want to, I want to know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I want, I want actually want to understand because I feel like I'm just yes, I'm praying, I'm going through the motions, but I want to understand what the words are in the translation, and that's it's led me now to i want to learn i actually want to learn arabic be able to like converse in arabic yeah, as well. well but the most important thing i said you know i'm reciting these words i'm saying it but like i want to understand what it means like it's going to change your every life, word man. yeah absolutely yeah. so I, I did start doing that and um yeah so i don't look on and learn a new surah unless i've learned the translation for it well wow. so i really take my time with it and and it does change your prayer I actually saw, uh, it's weird that we were talking about this because I saw a video on Instagram today. There was a, a brother said he went 30 years of prayer, Not he doesn't speak Arabic, so 30 years of, of prayer and he didn't understand it, never understood it. Mm-hmm. And then he started learning the translation and said it just, it was like he started again. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, and it's just, a lot more powerful when you understand what you're saying as well. Oh, yeah. definitely. Even, even just like one little section, which might be, you know, something you can learn from. And, you know, even when you're coming up and you say, Sami Allah, Malhami, that... Like even just the meaning of it, like like Allah Allah listens to those who call out to him and then he said, Abbin mm-hmm. Awalak al Hamd. And it's like, you know, oh Allah, it's you we call out to. Mm-hmm. Like even just something so small yeah, like that, like you know, you know when you just when you listen to it, especially, like when you understand yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're going through something, yeah. you're going through a trial yeah. really, and you know and you're and yeah, and, and you're you know, you're coming up from, you know, prostrating yeah. to your Lord. Yeah. And you're saying, you know, Sami Allah and Iman Hamid that he's like he is hearing me. Mm. You know, I'm calling that's out to amazing. him and he's hearing me. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Once you do understand the words, that's another thing that we all take for granted. Like myself and Kifah were Arabic speakers, you know, nat- natively. Yeah. And it's something that you take for granted. Yes. It really is. Yeah. Like we think, okay, it's just the basics. Yeah. Like we're, like we're good. We can, yeah. Yeah. But it's like there's so much we're missing out Absolutely. on. Like so much. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And also the history, because like I obviously started with learning learning the history and I'm, I'm pretty well versed in, in the history of Islam and the prophets. And when, because obviously I read, I read the English translated mm. like Quran and and because I've I understand the history of it, I, I know what I'm reading. Because yeah. obviously, it's a you know, it's not it's not the standard English that everyone yeah yeah yeah, yeah of course like that yeah. old style English. Yeah. But you can follow along. You understand, you know, when they what they're talking about, um, and it, it just changes your perspective of what you're reading. Because you know, I've like I have read like years ago, like you know, open a Quran and read, and it's it's hard to understand. It's hard to follow unless you know. What the meaning is behind it yeah um, yeah so i definitely encourage anyone who doesn't know like just go back through your surahs go th- one at a time and and truly learn the meaning because mm. i think i think it's not it's not it's not it was definitely not like pointless to do it but mm. it, it changes the prayer completely how does how does um your fight day look differently now so you've had a couple of fights now since you've you've become muslim yep. um does does fight day actually look different now um i mean but we we like, absolutely make sure we pray on that day. Mm. Um, and even like, say, see our duas <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, you know especially I mean? hard, huh? Yeah, that but, day. Yeah. Oh, man, how do I explain? Like, the last fight week, the best one we've ever had. We went to Utah for two weeks. Mm. Normally, we go to America a week before. It's not enough to acclimatize and get yeah. sleepy. So, we're like, we'll go two weeks before. We went to Utah and we're like, probably going to have a small Muslim population. It was actually quite big, wow. um, surprisingly. And we, we found a nice little, nice little mustard there. Um, the brothers were were nice, and we would go, we go every morning, every fajr, and every isha prayer. We'd go amazing, and, man. Um, we'd pray like every prayer on on time. We'd even even like some like sunnah, like staying till sunrise, hmm. reading Quran every morning, every morning. So the fight week was a lot different. Wow. Um, 
and just people again people aren't religious or, or muslim they won't they'll probably think you're a bit crazy for saying this but mm. i had three nights where i didn't so I had three days i didn't sleep at all wow because you get this fight week anxiety like i'm not nervous uh, but you just yeah, can't sleep yeah, your yeah, body's getting yeah. ready for war mm. i just made dua i just said like just take away the anxiety let me sleep that night that, that night onward i slept even the night before the fight i slept wow. first time in my career Wow. Um, and a lot of fighters will tell you that you don't sleep the night before a fight. So we're, like, we're all going in there sleep deprived. Yeah, and, wow. Um, and yeah, just, again, all the anxiety went away. I was able to sleep, um, took away all the stress. And again, it just, you, sometimes you have to remind yourself, you start thinking about the fight, you get a, bit, a little bit anxious and then you just remind yourself with, Sorry. You, just, you just remind yourself with the fact that it's like, it's all in Allah's hands. Yeah. He's the best yeah. of planners and, Win, lose, or draw, I'm, I'm grateful for whatever happens. Mm. And that so takes all the pressure off your shoulders. Because at the end of the day, like whether, uh, so what I used to tell myself before Islam was win, lose, or draw, my friend, my close friends and my family, they'll still love me. Mm. That's the that's the only thing that matters. And that used to take the anxiety away. Mm. Yeah. And now I have this another level where wow. it's, yeah. it's just hit somewhere else. Huh? It's just different, yeah. SubhanAllah. Um, you were talking about, you know, it's actually a really good point that, you know, a lot of the fighters that don't sleep the night before, you know, I think even people that watch UFC or watch fights in general, like they've obviously had a good night's sleep. Mm. They wake up yes. and they're watching and they're like, oh, come on, energy, energy. <laughs> like they, this is the reality of it, isn't it? Mm. Like you, you actually, you, you go through these things as a fighter. You go you mm. go through, you know, sleepless nights and, and whatnot. How, how, how does a person prepare for that? Like your body definitely understands it's preparing for war. Yeah. I think that's why it's not sleeping. It's, you know, you start getting like, sore muscles your back tightens up but it's wow. all there's nothing you can do during fight week like you get people get massages but it doesn't help your body knows what it's going into and it's, it's preparing yeah. subconscious it's, it's fighting against it huh <laughs> yeah I, I don't fight against it anymore. no, like, no yeah. i'll put my headphones on i'll yeah. you know i'll put um just like nature sounds mm. i'll just sit there i'll put a i'll put a movie on and i'll just sit there and if i sleep i sleep if i don't sleep i don't sleep yeah you just i've just accepted it now like i've done it for so long mm. that i'm used to it um but i've seen fighters I won't mention any names, but some of the biggest fighters in the world, like breaking down in the change room. Wow. And I've heard wow. stories about fighters breaking down in the change room, like begging their coaches, take my gloves off, take my gloves off. I don't want to- like, They can't do it, huh? Crying, huh? like tears. Unbelievable. It's just uh, so much. And then as soon as you start walking out, it just goes, and then you're ready to- Because you, you, don't, you don't see that. You just hear the song and they come out and yeah, they're confident. Yeah. And they look like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm warming up. Like, like even, the, even the last fight, I don't know what it is. When you're warming up, I feel like a, like a 12 year old would beat me. You feel unfit. You wow. feel like you're gassing out. You feel like you're weak. Wow. Yeah, and and most fighters will say that say the same thing. You just your body just like gets zapped of energy. But then once you walk out and once I hop in the octagon, especially I feel at home in there. And you you notice I always go down. I always touch the canvas, and then everything just comes back. Yeah, it's what's, crazy. What's the feeling like when you're walking down? I I know that's like the. Yeah, it's got to be the rush. Yeah, it, it is. It is a G up of some fighters. Like some fighters are really like collected and calm. Some fighters yeah. like to hype up. Um, I just, I just, whatever I feel as I'm walking out. Sometimes I've, I've, I've G'd up more. Sometimes I walk out and I'm more focused. But the one thing that I know is the times that I've seen the crowd's faces. Like I'll be like, oh, there's someone from the gym. They're the fights that I've lost. <laughs> and then the fights that I've won, it's like everyone's faces are blank. There's no faces. Oh, wow. Like I've high-fived my own mum before. And she, and she goes, afterwards, she's like, oh, do you remember high-fiving? I said, no. Wow. I said, you were just just, just digits in the crowd. Like, yeah, there's no right. faces. And when I hop in the octagon, it's like a, a big curtain, big veil comes around the octagon. I can't see out. It's black. I don't even like... Like sometimes I think there's no referee in there because it's just me and the opponent. Wow, that, that's They're your the focus. Yeah. Focused. And so it wouldn't it wouldn't matter if there's fifty thousand people or five thousand people. No. Wow. In fact, the the fighting in the um the UFC Apex with no crowd that's that's actually harder. Mm. You get a little bit of anxiety from knowing that you're fighting in front of a big crowd, mm. but when it comes to fight night, I, I much prefer the crowd. Mm. Much prefer the crowd. And if I can hear the crowd during the fight, they're the fights that I've I've not been focused. I've had fights where, I've had fights where like the crowd will start chanting. And I start clapping with them in the fight. <laughs> One fight I won after doing that, which was good. Then the next yeah. fight I did it and I lost. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it's it's just this like it's like you've got the blinders on. Mm. Literally, it's oh, just you see like the walkout and everything else around is black, and that's when you know you're hundred wow. percent focused. I'm 
personally, like I'm big into mindset, right? Like I was, I think I was talking before I, I listened to Chris Williamson and, you know, these kinds of podcasts. And one thing they always talk about is, is you have to have, a, you have to have a switch, you know, where you're, you don't actually prepare yourself for like, for example, I used to wake up and say, I need a morning routine before I get into my work or, you know, mm. before I jump into my business, business stuff. Um, where you actually have to be ready to, you know, switch on at any time. When I sit across from you now and you're just this nice, gentle guy, you know, personally, I've never sat across from someone who can break my arms in two <laughs> seconds, right? How do you, how do you actually, you know, make that switch, you know, from Jake Matthews, the man, to Jake Matthews, Jake Matthews, the fighter? Um, there is no switch. I'm always, I'm uh, always. I might just take a yeah, switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm always. I feel like I was. I was born for this. All right. I feel like I was born for this. Like I'm glad. Everything. I'm glad he's sitting closer to you. Then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I, I. I'm. I'm thinking back to my primary school days and high school days. I used to get in a lot of fights mm. because I used to defend kids and fight bullies. Right. So, but I was always calm. Like it was always. It was never like in a rage. I ne- one of those. One of those kids that would just freak out and see red. It was always like every time I got into a conflict, it was always calm and collected. Um, I've ne- there's, there is no switch. I'm I'm always Jake, the 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 warrior, I guess, the fighter. Mm. But I think the humbleness and the modesty, like if you look back through history with warriors, like they always talk about, it's like a, like a, the gentleness, the humbleness, being yeah. modest. That is part of being a warrior, being a martial artist. Um, I think the, there's a difference between a martial artist and a fighter. The guys that have that switch, I think they're like more fighters. Yeah, it's like when it's in front of them. Whereas I'm always ready to go. Like yeah. someone comes to the door right now. The UFC yeah. says, "Hey, you're fighting right now. I'm I'm ready to wow. go right now. Wow! And I'll perform no differently to if I went through fight week and a warm up. I'll perform the exact same. That's the thing. And yeah, I'll... like you don't you don't need time to switch. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I've kind of trained myself for this. I have no superstitions. Mm. If I have a coffee in the morning, if I don't have coffee, if I have three coffees, I won't train, train any different. Wow. If I go to the service, there's one service station on the Hume, like in Beverage. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna like smashing someone one day but i keep going in there yeah and like every like third time the coffee machine's not working yeah yeah and i just want it for the taste i don't i don't need it yeah and then it'll wind you, me you up enjoy you enjoy your I coffee enjoy, i just enjoy it and it's the only one between there and training so like i'm like okay no coffee but it doesn't change the way i train it doesn't change my mindset yeah. mm. if i rock up i've rocked up to fights and i've forgotten my mouth guard so i have to order a complete new mouth guard oh. like a five dollar shock doctor mouth guard for your c fight yeah it doesn't affect me wow i've yeah. forgotten my cup before doesn't affect me. Um, whereas there are guys who would like. I think it came down to I always, I always played mind games with myself. Like especially with like to say pre workout, everyone's taking pre workout back in the day. We'd go to to the gym after school. Everyone's taking pre workout, and I just sort of pieced it together. I said no, nah, no. Nah. I said because I said what if I create like a dependency on it? I that's said, that's, what, that's, that that's where that's where I am now. Yeah, I'm like the, if I forget it. I'm going to say, oh, I can't train, I can't train. I have friends that did this. Oh, I can't train, don't pre-workout. He forgets it, he drives they, back home. He's like, no, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. I'm, actually, train, I'm, I'm actually training tonight and I'm, I don't have my pre-workout. I don't you know don't what, what, what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's, all, it's all mental. It's, okay. it's, it's like 90% placebo. There's yeah. obviously things that like, do mm. stimulate you, yeah. but it's, it's mostly up here. Mm. Um, so I've just sort of, yeah, throughout the years, just coached myself and yeah, nothing, nothing throws me off. And, um, and now, I'll get, we'll talk about it again, but even now, putting my trust in in the plan. That's what I always say. I always mm. say, it's the plan. It's the yeah. plan. It's the plan. Um, that's even it's even more prevalent now. Mm. You know, your sense of justice that you had as a kid. Because um, I, I remember I used, to, I used to kind of have the same thing, but obviously I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the capabilities. I did ha- I did do martial arts. I, I have a martial arts background, a black bone in Taekwondo. I won't flaunt it too much, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, the first yeah, one running. <laughs> yeah. The, on, the only, th- oh, I left straight away. I actually didn't go back. So that, that's why I actually asked you before about that mindset of, you know, taking it to the next level. Yeah. Um, but I remember they always told us that you don't use your skill set outside unless you absolutely have to, yep. you know, for self-defense. Mm-hmm. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you still have that sense of justice? But you know you have your profile. You know you you know, you might actually kill the guy. You know yeah. <laughs> if someone if someone's yeah. you know if you're in a shopping center and someone snatches a lady's purse, you know do you still have that urge to you know go and you know well, defend? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't you, like, so, like some yeah. day like I shouldn't say some days like mm. I kind of like 
I have my fingers crossed that something like that would happen. Um, but oh, so, if, so if you see John, yeah. Yeah. make sure you're on your best behavior. He's um, thinking if they test me today. Yeah, touch wood. I've never been in that instance where I've seen something like that yeah. where I had to. But you, you would step in. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Outside of outside of school, I don't think I've had. So there's been it was one instance at a at a fight event. Mm. Um. But outside of school, apart from that one one instance, I've never had a street fight or been involved in one. Yeah. I'm, I'm the first one to defuse it. Yeah, that's my that's my go to. First one to defuse it. Um, obviously, there's like the limit, but I've never seen anything where I have to step in and intervene yet. Mm. And like, I hope I hope I don't have to because it's not you know I I don't necessarily want to have to intervene and you know get into a conflict. Um, and then I also don't want victims to go through it either. Like, I don't want something to happen. So I can jump in, mm. um, but yeah, I've, I've I've been pretty pretty lucky that I haven't had to have any conflicts outside of school. Mm. I was I was a, I was an absolute fiend in school. Like mm. like my, my dad would always get a phone call, Jason detention again, detention yeah. detention. <laughs> Can't pick up oh, why, why why why? <laughs> oh, this kid was getting picked on. Um, and obviously like no like no violence policy. Like we have to yeah. end the detention. Mm. Um, but it was for the right reasons. It was, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And then my my friends, like I, my friends in high school was just this motley crew of just like nerds, and I'll say that because like wow. I, I was yeah. a nerd myself as well growing up, even though I fought. Um, but yeah, and I still have those friends till today. Wow, you know, I've got friends that go to the gym, big buff friends, and then I've got friends that are like full into the anime, mm. and <laughs> it's it's from. Yeah, like, and I remember my old man telling people stories like, oh, like Jake would like defend this guy from a bully, and then he'd bring him into his friendship circle and. Some of these guys are still my friends still today. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah. I, I just, I just want to know a couple of things, maybe three things that mm -hmm. you've learned since becoming a Muslim that you wish you knew your whole life. We should have told you this it's, earlier. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> giving you some um, it's not that I can't, they're, they're right there. It's just, yeah. it's going to sound like a broken record because yeah. there's things I've already yeah. mentioned. But the the biggest thing is that, that there's a plan that's, it's not necessarily out of our hands. We have decisions we can make. But once once we make those decisions, you know, then like like the plan kicks in after that, and um, so that's one thing that I could I think I feel like I could have used in a lot of my fights. Um, I did suffer a lot of anxiety uh, when I was younger, um, even even like in training. So that was one thing that I've used now to calm myself down. I think would have been a massive benefit. Um, so that's one there. The second one is, is is surrounding myself with people of character that I want to portray, you know? Like, sometimes you get tempted, you know, there's people that you see and you kind of like want to be like them just just because of, the, you know, like, you, you, know, you see like kids with, like how kids see people on Instagram. They're not necessarily, mm. I'm trying not to word it in a bad way, like I don't want to, yeah. but like they might be a little bit like, like a degenerate kind of yeah. vibe mm -hmm. about them. Yeah. And it's cool at the time and you want to be like them, but, you know, and I've had phases where I've gone through that as well. But at the end of the day, I've, I've come back to wanting to. It's the guys in my circle that I'm I'm closest with, like they're the ones that I, I want to emulate and be like. So, um, and the only way you can do that is by surrounding yourself with people of good character. So, the, so there's a few things that I tell people, young kids that want to get into martial arts. It's the the main one is surround yourself with people of good character that are on the same path as you, um, whether that's whether, whether it's in business or martial arts, whatever you're pursuing. Um, and then there's a few other things like. You know, you will outgrow your gym and, you know, don't feel that sense of loyalty, like blind loyalty towards the gym. Um, I've always progressed and moved to gyms when I need to. Mm. And if, if I had stayed at the first gym that I was at, the local gym that I was training at, I wouldn't be in the UFC now. So I say to guys, you know, you do have to progress and you will outgrow a gym. You have to yeah. move on. It can yeah. be done amicably. I'm still good with every gym that I've left. Don't, there's no, yeah. you know, you yeah. can do it in a, in a No burn a bridges way. and stuff like Never, that, yeah. No, no. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's two. So third one. Something I know now, which I always knew. <sighs> Worshipping Allah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, again, like, mm. I love the fact that I found it on my own. Mm. I, you know, um, it was not something... I had, I've got mates that were born into it and they say... They're not... I mean, they're not envious of me, but they say, like, they do like the fact that I found it on my own. Mm. And it was my own journey. Um but then I've had I've had mates that are, you know Muslim mates that have, you know, been tempted, gone off the path, like yeah. mm -hmm. 
the past gone, like the can't see the past yeah. anymore, like that. Yeah. Right, you know? And they've come back. I said it's the same thing. Mm. You've you've gone into that that fun life. You've been tempted. I said now you've come back to your religion. I said that's no, no different to me finding my own journey. You know, you've gone out there. You've seen the other side, and now you're back you're stronger than ever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I do. Like sometimes I do wish I, I could have found it earlier, mm. and. Um, Maybe not got so many tattoos, but I mean, according to Islam, my my skin's, I tell people my skin's as clean as a baby's bum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, my, nothing since my shahada, so I'm clean. <laughs> I'll keep. Yeah. I've got, um, I've only got one more because my boys would kill me if I didn't ask you. Top five UFC fighters all Ooh, time. Okay. Only UFC or can it be? Let's five? go UFC just because it's, it's mainstream. You're going to upset a lot UFC? of people if you don't say Khabib. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, come on, don't put hey, words in his mouth. Everyone knows my favorite number one fight of all time is Khabib. No way. Um, oh, yeah. yeah he's yeah, a I get, I get roasted on... Uh, it, the UFC will post my photo of Sean Strickland and I'll comment, Khabib's number one fighter. I swear, <laughs> I do. It, and it's always the same fans that they hate it. They're so annoyed. Yeah. They go, this post isn't even about Khabib. <laughs> you know, every post is about Khabib. He's the number one. Um, so he, so I, I'll explain quickly. He's my number one, not just because of, of what he... He did in the octagon, mm. the potential what he could have done. Yeah, but the the biggest thing that it, for me, I, I judge the goats off how they are inside and outside the octagon. Mm-hmm. It's that's what being a professional is about. Being a martial artist, it's not just how you how you are in the fight. And I was I was already there, but the biggest thing that got me is he said, he goes, I'm I'm going to retire because I, he promised his mother yeah. that he wouldn't fight without his dad. So he's he's given up potentially being. On pa- like to me, he already is, but on paper, the best ever because mm-hmm. he would have destroyed everyone for the next 10, 15 he's, fights. He's, he gave that up yeah. and all the money, all the, the fame because he made a promise to his mum. And that was the day I said, yeah, look. And again, mm-hmm. again, talking about the character of, of, of um, you know, like people that I look up to, especially Muslims, like that's, that shows his character there. Mm-hmm. And that was the day I said, yeah, he's number one. Um, and then I've always looked up to George St. Pierre. He was always one of my favorites. Um, he was the reason why I wanted to be fight at welterweight. Um, he's tied with BJ Penn. So we'll say like two and three, are, yeah. you know, um, BJ Penn, just because of his jiu-jitsu was technical, but when he, well, you wouldn't know he's a, a jiu-jitsu fighter. He just fought like he was just a natural born fighter. Like what I consider myself to be like, I was born to do it. He was born to do it. He didn't have to like. Work it's very hard. natural, very natural. He didn't yeah. have to work hard to, to mm-hmm. like, he obviously trains hard, but he didn't have to work hard to bring that. Some guys, you have to really, like, train the mental side of them. Yeah. And some guys, just, you, you can't do it. They don't have it. Um. So, so yeah. So, George St. Pierre, BJ Penn. Um, I know he said UFC, but, like, i got to say Fatal. I have to say Fatal. Mm-hmm. Fatal is one of my all-time favorites. Um, I miss the Pride days. I, I wish they'd bring one back, one Pride event back, and I'll mm-hmm. jump in it in the Grand Prix. That'd Ooh. be awesome if they did that. Yeah, yeah. They should do like a 20th anniversary Pride event. Um, that'd be cool. And then, um, sorry, but my fifth favorite would be, I'll probably have to say Volkanovski, mm. especially after his last fight against Yoya. Because yeah. I, I, I live with Yoya in Chicago and Albuquerque. Um, trained with him a lot. And I thought it would be Volk's hardest fight. If not, Yoya would win. Yeah. And what Volk did to him, I just said, he's like he's he's pound for pound number one guy now. Um, he's he's a weapon. Yeah, Volk's absolutely. A weapon. You know. Yeah. So I've, it's it's definitely a battle between him and Islam. Um, I've heard he's a very nice guy as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's just your standard yeah. Australian. You wouldn't know yeah. as a fighter yeah. when you first met him. Yeah. Um, we've trained together in the past as well. So I'd ha- I'd have to throw him in there for sure. Mm-hmm. And um, again, again, because of his character, like he's not, he's. He's just he's a typical Australian. You know, Americans are bought, uh, a little bit different. They they so they like the clout and they're loud. Um, he's yeah, like, they're, they're, yeah. Whereas like as Aussies, we're not so much. Yeah. Um, and Alex, he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. He's the same from when he was fighting. I was in the UFC. He wasn't even in the UFC yet, and we're training yeah. together to being like number one pound for pound champion. And now he's in the UFC. So that's um, you know, a testament to his character as well. So I'd have to throw him in there as well for sure. Amazing. Amazing. Who who do you think has it between Hamza and Adesanya? <laughs> mm, I'm a massive fan of Hamza. Massive fan. Yeah, you know, I, I would love to see that. Because they're hard. both, they both, they've got that fire in them. Yeah. You know what? After seeing the fight against with Gilbert Burns, I'd have to, like, I'd have to say maybe, maybe Izzy, but. Yeah. But you never know. Like, with MMA, there's so many different aspects. You never know. I mean, 
Hamza. I could see Hamza up, grabbing him the way he what he what he did to um, Loudmouth. What's his name? Uh, who's this? Who, who fought against who? Uh, what comes up for his name? They call him Loudmouth. I've gone blank. Kevin Holland. So when you fought Kevin Holland, yeah. I, could, I could see the same thing happening with Izzy. Like that's how that's how good he is. But like Izzy's obviously a di- different level. It's yeah, just whoever yeah, gets yeah, their yeah, game yeah. plan. We when we train, we say you got to implement your first page. You'll notice a lot of times guys win. It's because they they implemented their their game plan first. Yes. They, they're dictating yeah. the fight. Mm. If you let the fighter get ahead, then that's when like, you sort now of now you're playing his game. Yeah, and the, there's always a, there's always a puncher's chance, obviously, but. Yeah. Normally, the guy who goes in there confidently implements the game plan first. He's normally the and, and that comes out all the time, just yes, always that's, in, in, in. I could see that initial barrage yeah. being a lot for Izzy. Um, obviously, over a longer period, a longer fight, Izzy's IQ comes into play. Um, but I, I don't watch, I don't watch UFC events. Hmm. I'm actually going to my first live UFC event next week in Sydney. No, <laughs> I've never watched one live. Yeah, and. I don't. Wa- I don't really watch the events. I don't watch anything on YouTube. The only thing I watch is, is Hamzat's YouTube channel. Really? Wow. Yeah. It it just jeez me up. His mindset, like mm. he just does not stop. Yeah. Does not yeah. stop. He's um. He had a video called Bo- like Born in War or Born for War, and it's not a put on. Like yeah, I've, I've seen on. his he's motivational he, videos. He's, he's something he else, man. Yeah. Um. So that's just like his channel is like the only one I watch in regards to UFC. So massive fan of him. So, like, some people call him um. The, the black Spider-Man of Khabib. He's like Khabib, but he's the <laughs> yes. ruthless yes, version. Yes, he is. He is. And he is. Like, they're, they're like, like split images yeah. of each other. Mm-hmm. But he's like that ruthless version yes, where Khabib yeah. is more, you know, calm and collected. He is. Yeah, he is. But, yeah, re- respect to all fighters, obviously. But, Absolutely. yeah, amazing. Khabib's, yeah. Khabib's changing out of an arm bar to go to a triangle. So yeah, He yeah. doesn't break someone's yeah. arm. Whereas Khabib's likely going to go from the triangle to the arm bar <laughs> so he can break it. You know what I mean? But, um, no, nah, he's, yeah. he's done well. He's done well. I'm a massive fan of his. Because yeah. purely because of his mindset, and oh, that's something, yeah. Yeah. you know, like oh, there's still fighters, even though I'm a UFC fighter, and these guys are technically like my my peers, colleagues. Yeah, there's guys that I, I look up to still mm. and try and take things away from them. Amazing, amazing, amazing. amazing. I think we're starving here, yeah? so we'll, we'll, yeah, go, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll wrap it up and go for a feed. Sounds good, yeah. yeah. Done, done. done. No, thank, thank you for thank, thanks for jumping on. We got a gift for him as well. We've got a gift, so, so I don't think he's right. going to be eating it to be fair. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll eat it. Oh, you'll eat it. Yeah, we've got, we've got, um. We've got amazing sponsors. Um, one of them is Malicious. Um, we will tag them. And they've always been giving, you know, gifts to all our guests on our podcast. So, mate, I'll love reward them. So, this you can take home, feed the kids. Thank you very much. You know. I don't yeah, think, yeah. mate, they, they might not be getting any of it by the time you get home. The on the way home. <laughs> but, no, nah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's absolutely a pleasure. And, yeah, we're going to go get a feed now. Thank you, brother. Thanks for watching, guys.